this morning the title of my talk is every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Uh, the very reason why we come to worship God together publicly on Sunday instead of the Old Testament Sabbath day on Saturday is because Jesus rose, he was resurrected on the first day of the week on Sunday. And indeed, in the early church, the early church believers, they called Sundays as Little Easter. So for them, every Sunday was Little Easter. It wasn't just a special day, just once a year, uh, some, you know, sometime in, in spring. Every Sunday was regarded as Little uh, Easter. And that's how they saw it. That's how they celebrated as they came together uh, each uh, Sunday. So for us, you know, although we can test the Easter weekend is over, uh, but still, this Sunday, today, and next Sunday, and the Sunday after, is a little Easter. It's an Easter Sunday. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Amen. Uh, Jesus is still alive, uh, and he is still, uh, you know, uh, reigning in our lives and reigning uh, in the world. And so we need to remind ourselves about that. I don't know, you know, what was, what was, the, uh, what was concerning your mind before you came to church this morning and yesterday. But let's remember, this is another Easter day, another Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. He is risen. He has risen. Amen? Amen. And so may the Lord open the doors of in our lives, open the doors in our lives where they have been firmly closed, because He is alive. And may the Lord untie all those entangled, complicated knots in our lives, because He is alive. Amen. And may the Lord uh, restore all the broken and shattered lives back to whole and meaningful and purposeful life because He is alive. Amen. Amen. So as we worship, uh, we worship uh, Jesus. Now we had uh, this uh, grace course uh, day uh, away yesterday. It wasn't away, it was here in church. And, uh, so we had this, this day uh, yesterday. And as part of the course, you know, often is the case, we, uh, we recited we proclaim, declare these statements, faith statements. And I was really reminded, I was really uh, enjoying them. You know, you are reminded of who you are in Christ. You are reminded of all the Bible truth uh, statements. Okay? You often forget that. Okay? And uh, you know, it seems like the immediate surrounding, immediate circumstance is looming large. And we forget who God is. And, and you know, so as we were, as we were uh, declaring this truth today, it was, it was really, really encouraging, uplifting. So I thought maybe we're going to, we're going to do it together this morning, okay? So it's called the Affirmation of Truth, okay? So uh, uh, there, are, there are several statements, okay? So let's declare together with faith and, uh, and, and see what it says. And this is true to all of us if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You ready? Okay. I joyfully announce the truth that I am deeply loved by God the Father. The Father loves me as much as He loves Jesus. The Father accepts me in Christ just as I am. The Father has lavished His grace upon me. The Father purchased me with the blood of His Son. The Father has poured out His love on me. I am my Father's workmanship, His poem. I am the echo of my Father's eye. I joyfully announce the truth that I am safe and secure in Christ. I am connected to Jesus like a branch to the vine. I am protecting, held in Jesus and the Father's hand. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, therefore in Him I do measure up. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I, I'm accepted yes. I am accepted in Christ to the glory of God. I died in Christ to the rule of sin and have been raised up to live a new life. I died to the Lord to the body of Christ. I will never be dirty or forsaken by Christ. I joyfully announce to children that the Holy Spirit lives in me and He is my strength. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit who was given to me by my Father. I am sitting by the Spirit who was given to me as a pledge of my full inheritance in Christ. I am led by the spirit of adoption and am no longer a slave to fear. He enables me to cry out, Abba, Father. 
I have been baptized by the Holy Spirit and placed into the body of Christ as a full member. I have been given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. I can walk by the Holy Spirit instead of giving in to the lust of my flesh. Amen. So that's the four pages of the affirmation of truth, and they are all true. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Uh, so this morning, uh, now two weeks ago, uh, if we can have the lights back, uh, please. Two weeks ago on Palm Sunday, we looked at this passage in John uh, 19, and we, we, we talked about some of the last sayings of Jesus uh, on the cross. And on Good Friday, it's the Sunday which had wonderfully led us through the key uh, passages uh, in the Bible. Now this morning, I want to uh, I want us to think about those three days of the Easter weekend from a slightly different angle. So we're talking about Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. So I just want to look at this slightly uh, from different different angle. The first thing is this: the Good Friday. Good Friday. Now I watched this program in BBC just a few days ago. And there's amazing traditions around Good Friday. You know, in, in, in the, uh, uh, they, they perform a passion play uh, in Trafalgar Square, in Guildford, and different towns and villages. They, and, and this has been going on for years and years. And then churches, they, they, they set up uh, large crosses. And uh, one was in the York Minster, uh, and there was a giant cross hanging in the air. Okay. Uh, they put this giant cross in the air in, inside the church. Uh, people coming into the church, all the guests and tourists, they're coming in and they just watch this cross and they are touched, some of them are touched by, by the cross and the message uh, it carries. And uh, the Archbishop of York, Dr. John Santos said, in some Orthodox churches, the Good Friday is actually called the Great Friday. Yes, we know that on that day, on that Friday, it was total injustice, injustice and sheer cruelty, the way that Jesus was crucified. Okay. But it is a good Friday. And it is an even great Friday for many, many reasons. Okay. And, and then we learned that from, from, from Richard uh, on Good uh, Friday. But one of the reasons why this Friday is great Friday is because even on that day, this is before Jesus' resurrection, but even on that day, Lives were transformed. You know, we want our life transformed, don't we? You know, we want our life changed and touched by God. Even on Good Friday, shortly after Jesus died, and as he was buried in the tomb, people's lives were transformed. As we see that in this passage, and John tells us stories about a couple of people, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Okay. It's only John in John's Gospel we see uh, the stories in Detail. Joseph of Arimathea. Now, if you've been to Glastonbury, uh, in Glastonbury, in this town of Glastonbury, you know, where there was a, uh, this famous, world famous festival, music, pop music festival every year. Okay. And there's a huge tall Glastonbury tall. And there's a legend in the town. And that is Joseph of Arimathea actually came to Britain and came to Glastonbury. And uh, he, he came with this, you know, state stop. Okay. Uh, so he was walking towards, uh, in, in Glastonbury. And he was tired and he put this stick into the ground. And they believed that this somehow became a live tree. Okay? And they can still show you that there are descendants of those trees even today. Okay, quite a few of them. So that, that's the legend in this town of Glastonbury. But there's no record in the Bible that Joseph of Arimathea ever came to uh, uh, British shows. And there's no credible record uh, in the history. But what is certain is recorded in the Bible. Uh, John 19 verse 38 he says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly uh, because he feared the Jews. Uh, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body uh, away. Uh, so who is this Joseph of Arimathea? Well, he was, uh, he was a man from the Judean town of Arimathea. This was a town uh, northwest of Jerusalem, a little town, okay, uh, and, and, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God, the Bible says. So, so obviously he was a godly Jew. All the Jews, they were waiting for the kingdom of God. So he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he was also a man of high standing. 
because Elsewhere in Luke's Gospel, he says he was a member of the council, a good and upright man. Okay? So this is a very, uh, this is some Hedrian, and it was only uh, 70 people, so very high standing, a very important person uh, he was. And also the Bible says he was a rich, there was, there was, they came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. And so he was able to uh, have this tomb in the garden. And, and so this was very expensive, it was very, uh, very precious, very uh, expensive uh, tomb. But he, was, he, was, he, he owned that tomb because he was rich. So we're talking about a man of high standing, and who had a power, who had a position, who had a wealth. And he was also Jesus' disciple. Uh, he says, now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. It's interesting because the, the word disciple in, in Greek, uh, Martes, it's often used to describe the 12 disciples of Jesus. It's an almost exclusive uh, word for 12 disciples of Jesus. But when, when the Bible talks about Arimathea, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, they use this same word, disciple, Maletes of Jesus. So it, it tells us that he was he was an important person. He was an important follower uh, of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. So in many ways, he was a man of honor, you know, good man, great man. Man. But then there is a line that tells us the other side of Joseph of Arimathea. It says, but secretly, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. So his faith was very much secret. Okay. Uh, he didn't tell anybody, and no one knew that he, he was a follower of Jesus, that he was a Christian, and he just kept it quiet, kept it silent. Okay, making sure that no one knows about it. Well, the, you know, the reason is perhaps because he, he may lose his face. He may face some kind of loss, and maybe he, he may face you know, some kind of disadvantages in the society. Okay? Uh, and, and Jesus was killed. Okay? He, was, he was executed. So it's not a popular thing to say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's, a, that's dangerous. Okay? You, you'll be the next uh, to be executed. So Joseph, you know, although he was a follower of Jesus, he believed in Jesus, he was a believer, but secret. And I wonder sometimes that's how we, uh, you know, do our Christian lives. I remember, uh, in, 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 now I know that the, I, I'm a firm believer in, in reading the Bible in open and public places. You know, I, uh, uh, I, I, I had quite a few, uh, you know, uh, uh, occasions when I read the Bible on the tube, quite publicly, quite open, you know, reading the tube, uh, reading the Bible on the tube, and people were impressed by it. They were touched by it. And they, they wanted to invite me to speak in their church, even though they didn't know me. Okay? Because just simply because I was reading my Bible uh, publicly, openly, on the tube. A couple of occasions. And then, you know, they, 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 they approached me and they spoke to me, wow, you're reading the Bible on the tube? Yes, I am. And even, you know, a hospital corridor. I was reading the Bible one time, and uh, this cleaner kind of passing by looked at me and wow, that's 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 good. So I'm a firm believer reading the Bible in open and public places uh, today. But it wasn't always like that. Years ago, when I was uh, you know a teenager, a Christian, young Christian, I was rather ashamed of carrying the Bible. So I had to carry the Bible, but I made sure it was all covered. And so it looks like a, you know, maybe another textbook, an English book, a math book. I cut it, make sure it's wrapped up, and, and, and so, so uh, no one notices I'm carrying the Bible, I'm a Christian, because I was ashamed. Uh, I was afraid of the people, what people might think of me. So Joseph of Arimathea was a bit like that. He was a believer, he was a disciple, but he was afraid. He was afraid of the Jews. But then, as he observed what happened on the Good Friday, you know, Jesus is amazing. He spoke these seven words. Okay, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Okay, hello, hello, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm thirsty. It is finished. So he, he said these amazing words. And it seems like uh, that really spoke to Joseph. So he came out of that secrecy and he's now quite openly, he comes to Pilate. And he says, you know, excuse me, sir, can I, can I have the, uh, the body of Jesus, please? That's a very dangerous move, don't you think? You know, he was just executed. And, uh, and Paul said, so, so are you in the same group then? Okay. 
So it was a very dangerous move. But Joseph came out of this secrecy and he quite publicly demands, asks Pilate to give him uh, the body of Jesus. A secret believer turned into a sincere Christian. The Bible says he boldly, he went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. So we see, on, even, even, even on the Friday when Jesus was you know, buried, we see this amazing change, amazing transformation. Someone who was secret believer turning into a sincere follower of Jesus. And then there's another man. You know, here, verse 39, he said he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. It's interesting, you know, Nicodemus has always this nickname, the guy who visited Jesus at night. Okay? You remember John 3? John chapter 3, he came to see Jesus. But again, he was a man of high standing. He was a member of uh, uh, the uh, Jewish council. Uh, but then perhaps he was afraid of what people might think of him. So he came to see Jesus at night. And Jesus said, uh, unless you are, you, are, you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So he had an amazing conversation with Jesus that night. But John chapter 3 doesn't tell us that Nicodemus went and accepted Jesus there and then. Whereas if you look at the next chapter, John chapter 4, this woman uh, at the well, you know, in Samaritan town, she was completely transformed there and then, didn't she? You know, she came, she came through the middle of the night, out there in the middle of the day to draw the water, and after the conversation, she was completely transformed. So she returned to town and called the everyone, come and see, come and see. And for Nicodemus, you don't see. So again, he, 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 he stopped the journey it was a long journey, but it was all very quiet, all very silent. He was searching, he was asking questions, he was investigating, but all very quiet, secret, silent, nobody knew. It was a long journey. And I wonder sometimes we take that same uh, journey as well. Okay. Uh, we are passion, we want to find out, we want to investigate, but then, you know, little by little, uh, slowly but surely, you come to understand Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So when it comes to John chapter 7, he actually goes quite strong. He says, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, uh, asked, does, does our Lord condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? So when the Sanhedrin was trying to condemn Jesus, he said, no, 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 we can't, we can't just do that. So he was opposing, he opposed them to stand for Jesus in John chapter uh, 7. When it comes to this chapter, John chapter 19, he comes to Jesus and found the river quite often. He says, Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Uh, nothing special about you know, him bringing uh, the mixture of myrrh and aloes. You know, they, they were used as a, embalming the body. That body, you know, that was part of Jewish custom. Nothing, nothing, nothing amazing about that. Nothing unusual about that. But what is unusual is is the quantity, the quantity, a mixture of more than others, about seventy-five pounds. Now, if you have an NIV, you look at the footnote. Okay, at the bottom of the chapter page, uh, you look at the footnote, and uh, in footnote it actually says in Greek, a hundred litri. Okay, 100 litri, that's the Greek word, 100 litri, and that is about 34 kilograms. So Nicodemus brought 34 kilograms of a uh, mixture of myrrh and aloes. You can only use that amount of myrrh and aloes to embalm a dead body when it comes to king's funeral. You cannot afford to do that on an ordinary person. It is only on king's funeral the national, you know, uh, king's funeral, uh, he deserves that amount of myrrh and aloe, 75 pounds, 34 kilograms. Nicodemus clearly thought and accepted Jesus as his king. Remember, this is again very uh, private ceremony. Okay? It's not popular, it's not like an open burial, open funeral service. It's not like everybody is invited. It's this funeral service, okay? So, so again, it's very dangerous. 
if you if you regard this body of Jesus who was just executed in that way, if you if you respect and regard it that way, you will be you will be in trouble. But Nicodemus doesn't mind. And he, he brings this amazing quantity of mud. They're very expensive. They are highly sought after. They're very expensive. Okay, they, you know, they, the, the mud and others, you know, they, they, they're like a fragrant perfume and they're like a gum from a certain trees. They often are uh, imported from other nations. Okay, very expensive, highly sought after a product. But Nicodemus bringing all those, all those mud and aloes and, and, you know, and, 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 and bring them to honor uh, Jesus uh, in that way. He's not doing that to show off to, to anybody. He's not doing that to, to impress anybody. You know, sometimes in our funeral service, that's what people do. You know, uh, to, to, to show to other people, this is how I honor my family member, my father, my mother. But there's none of those in, in this occasion. In fact, often when people were executed on the cross, they were just dumped. You know, the bodies were just like a rubbish. They just dumped and piled on a hill, okay? So you go to Jerusalem in those days, you will see this pile of dead about corpse. And they're just lying around, you know, in this, in this, in this, in this place. And you know, the, the vultures and the flies, they, they were all over the place. That's how they treated uh, the, the dead bodies uh, from the crucifixion. But Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they come, they take the body of Jesus and, and, and bring this amazing quantity of mud and others. It really shows, it really shows their love for Jesus. And I wonder when we come to worship Jesus, how we do it. How we do it. You know, he deserves our full honor, our full respect. He deserves the very best. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And whatever we do, whatever service we do in the name of Jesus, he deserves the very best. He deserves the very best quality in that. It cannot be lukewarm, half-hearted, or you know, you know, I don't, I don't really care. And you know, that's that's not that's not what we see uh, here. And so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were secret believers initially. Uh, you know, took took some time, but in the end, they were transformed. Amazing follower of Jesus. That's what happened on a uh, Good Friday. And then we move on in this passage. You know, you read, you read uh, chapter 19, the last part of chapter 19. And then if you go to chapter 20, it talks about immediately early on the first day of the week. So it's a Sunday. It's a Sunday. What, oh, what about Saturday? You know, we talked about Good Friday. And then, you know, and then it's Sunday. So we're in a Saturday. We're in a Saturday in between. Well, the Bible doesn't really talk about what happened on Saturday. It doesn't. Mark, uh, Matthew, Luke, John. It doesn't really talk about There's no, no verse in it. There's no verse in it uh, where it talks about what happened on uh, the Saturday. Apart from in Matthew's Gospel, it talks about what happened on Saturday. Not about Jesus, but about you know the soldiers. You know, they, 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 they went to the, uh, the, the priest and they, they were bribed, they were given money, and they started lying about you know the, the disciples came and they stole the body. So that's why it's written in Matthew's Gospel. But nothing about, nothing about what happened to Jesus. It's all very quiet. It's all very silent. And we understand it. Why? Because he's lying. He's dead. Real dead. Okay? Lying, lying dead in the tomb, borrowed by Joseph of Arimathea. He's lying there. Okay. So what's the point of all that then? You know, wouldn't it be better on Good Friday he died, and then just a few hours later on Saturday, he's again, alive again, he's risen. Why? Why do you have to wait for another day or two until Easter morning? You know, why not just spread the Easter message straight away? You know, uh, on a Saturday, a few hours later. Why do the silence and the absence of the body, absence of Jesus and the silence of Jesus in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's the weekend we have, we have a Good Friday. In English, we have Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. In Korean, in my native language, we don't have a name for the Saturday. We have a Good Friday and we have an Easter Sunday, but we, have, we don't have any name for Saturday. This is a Saturday, just in between. As though there's no meaning on this Saturday. But I like the way in English it is called Holy Saturday. 
is not Easter Saturday, so Easter Sunday is important, so because it's just in the eve of this Easter, so it's Easter Saturday, but it's not Easter Saturday, it is Holy Saturday. And it has a very important meaning and purpose on this Saturday. If you think about the disciples, when Jesus was suffering, at least they could see him. Yes, he was he was bitten, he was tortured, you know, blood was all over the place, the crown of thorns, you know. But at least they could they could see him. And even on the cross, when he, he was hung on the cross, at least they could see him, at least they could hear him saying those last words. At least they could see and hear what he was saying. But on Saturday, he disappeared completely. There was an absence of Jesus, and there was silence of Jesus. You don't see him, and you don't hear him. Disciples, for the disciples, it must have been really, really difficult. You know, sometimes you feel, you know, in our Christian life also, we feel like God is absent, God is not around. I'm looking for him, I'm finding him, I'm trying to find him, but he's not around. He's absent. And I'm, I'm trying to listen to him. I'm trying, I'm trying, you know, I want him to speak to me. He's a quiet. He's a silent. So in our own Christian lives, we sometimes have the absence of God and the silence of God, which is very difficult. And, and on that holy Sunday, that's what the disciples are experiencing. You know, we, uh, often when people, people lose their loved ones, parents or children or brothers and sisters, uh, during the funeral period, uh, you know, it's very busy. You know, you have guests, you have people in, in the house, and then you have to organize some. Somehow you can you need to organize all the funeral, uh, you know, the, the food and everything. So it's very busy. So you don't really have time to properly mourn for the loss of the loved one. It is only after that everything is over, everyone gone back, everyone left, and all the all, all the ceremonies are over, and uh, you wake up the next morning. When it's all tired, it suddenly hit you. Uh, the absence of that person is so, so loud. It hit you, you know. And that's when people often begin to really mourn and realize he is really gone. She is really gone. No more. So I'm sure for the disciples, it, it was that Saturday. You know, it must be really tough. Really, all those dreams and all those aspirations. Remember Peter, you know the, the, the fishermen. They all they all gave up for Jesus, but then he's gone. So what happened to me? What's going to happen to me? All shattered dreams. It was very very uh, tough indeed. But surely, the following morning, Jesus rose again. He appeared to them. He was he was alive. Okay. So they they were overjoyed. They were so excited. They were so grateful. They thought it's gone. It's finished. Okay. When they met the resurrected Jesus, it just completely changed their lives. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that you seen, you know, going through the, the darkest hour in your life, the toughest hour. And God is silent. God is God is absent. My brother says, if that's you, just remember. Easter Sunday, Easter morning is coming. Amen? Amen. Holy Saturday might be darkening, you know, deepening, but Easter morning is surely coming. Jesus is still alive. He is alive indeed. Amen. Amen. And then we come to this Easter Sunday. You know, on this Easter Sunday, we have this spectacular phenomenon that was, you know, John doesn't record it, but in Matthew's Gospel, there was a violent earthquake, uh, and, and the angels appeared, they rolled, rolled the stone away, uh, and the angels spoke to the, to the women and said, he's not here, he has risen. Okay. We have this amazing, uh, spectacular phenomenon. And Pilate and the, you know, the, the, the priests, they, they really wanted to make sure that the tombs are secure. Okay. Uh, they, they sealed it and they posted the guard. They put this huge uh, stone uh, at the entrance to the tomb, just making sure no one comes in and steal the body. But then you can't, you can't stop the angels. The angels, supernaturally, they came and they strolled it away. Okay, we move a stone, a uh, stone, and then the, and the body, uh, the body of Jesus, he rose, he resurrected. And so what follows is we see this number of people uh, who initially were, were, were downcast, were worried, were discouraged. 
but they were all transformed. They were all transformed. You can see, you see the lasting changes uh, in Eastern people. There was, a, there was a group of Christians who called themselves Eastern people uh, some years ago. I don't know whether they still operate today or not. But they called themselves Eastern people. They were just a group of ordinary Christians. Okay. But they called them Eastern people because, yes, I'm an ordinary you know, a Christian, but I, I have met the reason Jesus. I know the Jesus. Not, not as a history, but as a real person. He's alive today. He's alive in my life. So they call Easter, themselves Easter people, and they tell others about the story of Easter and the story of Jesus. And so we see here that Easter people, Mary Magdalene, she was crying. She was crying, and when Jesus even when uh, Jesus appeared, he said, uh, "You know, thinking that she, he was he was a gardener. Uh, have you taken the body of Jesus? Uh, can you please give it to me?" But when Jesus said, "Woman," in in, in his amazing uh, loving voice, she realized, and and uh, and she turned to Jesus and said, "Rabbi." All those cry, all those tears turn to joy and excitement. And then we see the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were, they were, you know, the Bible says they were, uh, they, they didn't recognize Jesus. He, he appeared. The spiritual eyes were closed. Uh, and they, they were sad. They were downcast. When Jesus showed them that he was really alive, they said here, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and open the scriptures to us. So people who are downcast, who are sad, who are discouraged, Jesus brought this burning desire in them. Okay. So they went back to Jerusalem and tell the disciples, tell their friends about Jesus' resurrection. And then the, 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 the ten disciples in, in Sunday morning, uh, you know, they were all they were all locked, locked in. They closed the door because of fear of the Jews. And you know, the fear was reigning in that room. But then Jesus appears. And he said, peace be with you, shalom. Peace be with you, not once, twice. Shalom, peace be with you. So they experienced the peace of Jesus. And uh, they, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. Instead of fear, he gave the Holy Spirit. And he gave, uh, he gave peace to the disciples. So they experienced the amazing transformation on that Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is an Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen? So the stories we read in the Bible, we can also experience in our own lives too. Would you like to all stand together? Let's all stand together. And uh, let's sing this uh, wonderful song, Because He Lives. I don't know whether we have a song uh, sheets. Uh, lines, but let's, let's sing this, just, you know, just chorus. <coughs> Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. And just ask yourself, do I act like Jesus is alive? Or do I act like Jesus is dead? And buried still. And when we know that he alive, he lives, we can face tomorrow. I think so. Just close, just close. Yes, because it is.
things in the office downstairs that still I'm sorry about it. Let me just embarrass you a little bit. And I was doing my things in the office downstairs. And then I saw the screen that this brother came just quietly and cleaning the church just by himself. Um, I thought, wow, this is good, this is beautiful, this is wonderful. But that's what it means to serve Jesus, isn't it? Don't, 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 don't try to find any recognition or praise from anybody. You just want to serve God. You just want to serve Jesus. David said, King David said, I'm like a gatekeeper. I'll be happy to be a gatekeeper for thousands of years. I'm just happy to open the gate and close the gate and make sure you know, the, the, the temple is secure. I'll be happy, he said, to be a gatekeeper. And uh, you know, God has called us to serve him and to serve his church and to serve his people. In whatever capacity it may be, however little and however big it may be. Nicodemus treated the body, dead body of Jesus like a king. King. In the midst of the danger, all the dangers. Brothers and sisters, we are the midst of people. And when he's alive, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. All fear is gone. And he receives our worship. And he enjoys our song. He listens to our prayer. And he'll be with us until the end. Amen. Amen. Let's pray and uh, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, as we can, we can, we can continue to grow, we can serve you, we can worship you, and let's pray for our church, that we can bring the good news of Jesus in this town, on the streets, in people's homes, children, adults, young and old, men and women, uh, and so we bring the glory to Jesus. Let's, let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Someone who loved us so 
much and gave his own life for us, even though we didn't deserve none of it. And who rose again from the dead powerfully, supernaturally, and who is alive today, who reigns today, who leads us and guides us today. Thank you. We love you, Jesus. We love you from the bottom of our heart. We want to praise you. We want to sing to you. We want to worship you. We want to serve you with joy, with commitment, because you deserve all the very best from us. Until the last breath, until the day we stand before you, we want to serve you. We want to serve your church. We want to serve your people. So God, help us. Hold out your grace for us. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Use our church, oh God, so we can continue to reach out to the people in our town. Thank you. Use my brothers and sisters in their families, in their workplaces, in their neighborhoods. Use them in an amazing way. Fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Open the door of heaven. Hold on your spirit. Each and every one of us. Hallelujah. We are the least of people. We are the least of people. Jesus is alive. He's alive today. He is risen today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We pray all these things. Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Amen.